everybody, I am that nursing prof and welcome to my channel. In today's video, we're talking about Tetralogy of Fallow. So let's get into it. So first of all, what is it? This is a congenital heart condition. So babies are born with this and it has four structural defects of the heart. If you remember Tetra, the beginning of this word means four. So this is telling you there's four issues going on and they're all creating a big problem. This can be really complicated. So what I try to do is try to take each of the four things and make them as basic and simple to understand as possible. So let's go through them before we get into anything else. So the first structural defect is pulmonary stenosis. So the pulmonary artery, right, which connects to your lungs and your heart. So think about anatomy, think about the structure of your heart. The pulmonary artery narrows. So it decreases blood flow to the lungs. So there's less oxygenated blood in the heart. So that's the first problem. The second one, ventricular septal defect. So there is a hole in between your left and right ventricle. So the septum, the bottom part of your heart that separates the left and right ventricle, there's a hole that shouldn't be there. So this is what this is causing. There's a hole between the ventricles and it causes the blood to mix. So you have your oxygenated blood and your unoxygenated blood and they're mixing together. This causes a decrease in the oxygen supply to the body, right? Because if we're starting to pump out this mixed blood that has some oxygen and some not oxygen in it, then the body is not getting as much oxygen through the blood and that's not good. The third one is the aorta is slightly displaced. So in normal anatomy, your aorta is a little bit more towards the left of the heart. In this, it is shifted towards the right. And then this receives that mixed blood and it pumps it out to the body. So less oxygenated blood is going to the body. And then the fourth structural defect going on here is right ventricular hypertrophy. So this happens when the heart is working too hard. So the heart has really high workload. It's really working to pump out that blood. And what happens is the muscle in the ventricle starts to thicken. It starts to get bigger. So hypertrophy, right? That means get bigger. So the heart has increased workload, which thickens the muscle. And that's okay temporarily, right? That's a temporary fix, but we can't live like that. It's not gonna work over time. And over time, it will become weaker, the heart will become weaker, and eventually it will fail. So this is four heart problems all at the same time. That's what this stands for. So let's talk about the risk factors, the causes, the symptoms, and what else we can do about it now that we understand what it all composes. When it comes to the cause, there actually isn't one. It's an unknown cause, but there are some risk factors that could um, contribute. So a lot of these are related to mom during pregnancy because of course this is a congenital defect, so you're born with it. So if the pregnant woman is infected with rubella, also known as the German measles during pregnancy, you're at higher risk for developing it. Alcohol use during pregnancy, being malnourished or over the age of 40, or if mom or dad, the parents, have had a history of it themselves, so if the genetic component. And if the baby has other things going on like Down syndrome, that is also a risk factor for developing this. And how is it diagnosed? Well, there's a couple things we can do. Uh, if you notice a heart murmur on the baby, it doesn't mean that they have this, um, but it means you should look more into it. So you might hear a heart murmur on the baby. Most places will do what's called the CCHD, so the congenital heart disease screening test. And all that is, it's a pulse ox. It's really simple. It's a pulse ox that we put on baby's hand and we put one on their foot. And then we're just measuring the oxygen in their blood of their upper extremities and their lower extremities. And a lot of times this tool, it's not diagnostic but we can use it to let us know that we need to do further studies. So most babies will get this done in the hospital. It's really simple. It takes like five minutes and most babies will pass it and do fine. If they do not do well, if they have an O2 level less than 95 or if their upper body and lower body readings are separated by more than 3%, they might order 
an EKG, or an echocardiogram. And that is what's going to help doctor determine whether or not they have these structural defects. And the thing about the murmur, I just wanted to point out, that was kind of the old school way. Back in the day before we started doing this pulse ox check on the babies, we checked for murmurs. But not every murmur is so obvious, not all of, them, all of them are so loud, not everybody is used to hearing them, so sometimes murmurs would get missed. So this pulse ox thing is the easiest, safest way to help us determine if they need further testing. And then the further testing is what's going to be diagnostic. So that's going to be your echo or your EKG. They might also do a chest x-ray, and the chest x-ray is going to look a little different. They're going to say you have a boot-shaped heart, and that is because of the aorta displacement and the hypertrophy of the right ventricle. So they say it looks boot-shaped. So that's how this is diagnosed. Now let's talk about the signs and symptoms. And I think you're going to notice a little bit of a pattern here. A lot of these are related to that lack of oxygen. We just talked about how the deoxygenated blood and the oxygenated blood mix and then get distributed. So they're not getting really good oxygen throughout the body because of that. So we're going to start seeing symptoms related to that. Things like cyanosis, so the bluish discoloration of the skin and mucous membranes. Shortness of breath or even rapid breathing. If you remember a newborn, 110 to 160 is regular breathing for them, so it might be increased. Poor weight gain. Fatigue, they easily fatigue with basic things like eating. They might be irritable. They might have an obvious heart murmur. Older children might experience things like fainting, clubbing of the nails, which we know is related to poor oxygen supply to our extremities, to our fingers. And then the big one, the hallmark sign of this, are called tet spells. So tet spells happen because there is a rapid drop in the oxygen in the body, okay? So this is not good, this is an emergency and the nurse needs to do something about it right away. So what do we do if our patient is experiencing a tet spell? We put them in the knee to chest position. We of course give them oxygen. We usually have to give them IV fluids and then calm them down because if they're crying a lot, which could be another symptom here, prolonged crying, if they're crying a lot, they're using up a lot of oxygen to do that. So getting them to calm down, getting them to rest, is going to help conserve that oxygen for them. So how is this treated? Well, as you can imagine, a congenital heart defect involves surgery, right? It needs to be repaired surgically. So there's two types of surgery. Typically, they'll do this procedure and then they'll do this one second. So they'll do a temporary shunt to help increase blood flow to the lungs, but that, again, it's temporary. It's not going to be final. So they'll do that, and then they will do intracardiac repair. Because it's structural problems, right, we need to fix those structural problems so that the heart can work normally. So what are they going to fix? First, they're going to patch up that hole. We talked about that hole, that ventricular septal defect. So we need to patch up that hole so that blood stops mixing. They need to repair or widen the pulmonary valve because remember it's very narrow. And these two repairs will help fix the other problems. So once these are repaired, the workload of the heart will decrease. And so that right ventricle will stop having to work as hard, it will stop getting bigger, it will stop thickening, and therefore it won't get weaker. So that's a good thing. So these repairs will help fix the other issues. Another kind of special thing I wanted to point out is sometimes they will give prostaglandin E. This helps keep the ductus arteriosus open to help allow the blood flow to the lungs so that it becomes more oxygenated. So sometimes they will do that. Now if we remember, the ductus arteriosus is a normal part of fetal heart anatomy. It is not a defect. It is not a problem. It normally closes soon after birth. But in this case, they want to keep it open. They want to have a little bit of that fetal circulation going so that we get more blood flow to the lungs. Again, this would also be a temporary thing. And when it comes to surgery, I know it sounds like, oh, we'll just repair this and we'll just repair this. This is heart surgery on a baby. So think about how important and scary and emergent this is. So we have to keep that in mind. When we do surgery on a baby, we don't like to do surgery on a baby, first of all. When we do it, though, we do it when it's safest. 
is usually safest between six months and 12 months of age. So before their first birthday, but after about six months old. So they might start initial things like a shunt or the prostaglandin E, things like that early on. And then later on when they're a little bit older and it's safer for them to tolerate surgery better, then they'll do the intracardiac repair. A few more things I wanted to make sure I mentioned in this video. After surgery, you still want to monitor for arrhythmias. This can happen. Sometimes they're not a big deal. They don't produce symptoms. Sometimes they are a very big deal and they can be life-threatening. So keeping an eye out for that. They can be treated sometimes with medication, an ablation, or worst case scenario, they might require a pacemaker. This is one of those things, after they have the surgery, it doesn't mean, okay, everything's good, you're done forever. They require follow-up with a cardiologist for the rest of their life. So this is very serious, and it is something that they need to monitor for the rest of their life. So making sure you let the patients know that, or the parents know that of the patient, that they're going to have lifelong cardiologist follow-ups. And then just a couple of complications I wanted to point out. Endocarditis being a big one, the big scary one, this is a bacterial infection that can occur after surgery. So of course we're going to give antibiotics and we're going to monitor for signs of infection. Pulmonary regurgitation, so the blood backs up and goes and backflows. Um, coronary artery disease and then leaking of the vessels that have been repaired. So the ventral septal defect, we repaired that hole, well, maybe it starts to leak a little bit. A little bit of blood starts coming out of the repair area. Or the pulmonary valve starts to leak a little bit. So these are things we want to keep an eye out for, complications, which is why they need that lifelong follow-up to make sure that everything is still working and going well. That was my video. I hope you found this helpful. Don't forget to like and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments, please let me know. And if not, I'll see you on the next one.